I'll be reading from 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. To the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder and as a witness of Christ's sufferings, who will also share in the glory to be revealed, be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be, not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. In the same way, you who are younger, submit yourselves to your elders, all of you, Clothe yourself with humility toward one another, because God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, stand firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. All right. When uh, we moved up here last year, I preached the third week I was here. Now, I only have one more Sunday after this. Brittany has two. So, some, s- sim- what's the word I'm looking for? Symmetry. symmetry. <laughs> some symmetry between then and now. Um, Usually when I preach, I'll preach from my computer. I'll write out all the words, and I will basically read from a script. We call that manuscripting in preaching. Uh, This Sunday, I wanted to talk to you a little different. Um, This is going to be a different... I say that like all the time. Every time I do something, this is going to be different. Uh, This sermon is going to be structured not as much as a sermon as usually when I would preach. We're going to have two distinct halves. You're going to know exactly where the distinction is because we're going to do some science experiments in the middle, which is why we had to clear the area up here because we got to have room for the kids to come up. Uh, So that'll be happening in a little bit. Um, I'm going to try not to pace too bad because now that I'm not tethered to a podium like normal, I want to just wander around the whole time, um, which is awful. and, and, And my phone, my notes, I need those. Okay, so now we're ready to go. We have loved our time here. We want you to know. Uh, We have enjoyed being a part of this congregation. We've enjoyed being with you and seeing you and knowing you and going into your homes, working with your children, working with your family, and know that uh, part of us will remain here (coughs) as we move on to Oklahoma um, to do the work there. Um, This is the first Sunday here after Paul, that we're going to have a sermon. Last Sunday we had prayer service, and now business as usual kind of begins to return. Um, It's an interesting place to be. It's the second time in not too long that you're having to go through this. Um, You know, the first century church, they didn't really have preachers. Sometimes they had a Paul that would come in and preach for a while and then leave, so you're in good company. (laughs) Terrible Bible jokes, right? Um, So don't, don't worry too much about that. You have a lot of people here with a lot to say, and in the early church, that's what happened. The people who were studying would share messages. They would join together to break bread. Service wasn't about a sermon. In fact, if I had to rank the importance of things in the service, I'd put the Lord's Supper at the top. I'd put the fellowship hall second. 
Mm, prayer third, class fourth, singing fifth. Oh, contribution would probably be like sixth. Announcements would be maybe seventh. Uh, well, reading should be in there somewhere higher up, and sermon as one of the lowest things of importance. Class would be higher up too. Because there's something that happens in discussion, and there's something that happens in talking, and there's something that happens in not just being talked at. And it's not that there's not important things that can come from this kind of forum, but there's something even more important about the idea of family and becoming one. And I don't know that the sermon does that the same way that just being together and getting to enjoy each other and sharing the meal where we take in the body of Christ and the blood of Christ and we remember why we're here. Because that's why we're here. We are here because of Jesus. We're here because of what Jesus brought to us. So what I want to do for this first half of the sermon is talk about some of the things that we've seen and experienced here. As you're about to go through a time of disorientation, you're going to be trying to figure out what your place is. There's a lot of questions going on because of a quick minister turnover. I want to remind you of some of the things that are great about this congregation. Because there are great things about this congregation. I want to remind you of your children. We've gotten to spend a lot of time with your children. Brittany taught two of the quarters that we were here, and we've spent lots of other time with them. You've probably all seen her walk in, and a child runs at her, and she bends down, and like Snow White in the forest, the flock comes out, and they all gather around, and it's exciting. Um, we love your kids, and you have great kids. And the kids are not just the future of the church. The kids are the church. Jesus called the children to him. The children are important. Um, Mark, I know, has been talking a lot about that lately. And it's, it's a big deal. It's a big deal. This is the next generation of faith. These are kids that are going to go through some different experiences than you went through growing up, and that's not bad. It's not good. It is. And that's okay. It's going to be okay. God is, is sovereign. And God loves you and your kids, and it's going to be good. We spend a lot of time with your teens, too. We've done teen class most Wednesday nights that we've been here. Um, either sitting in or teaching. And you've got a good group. Uh, one of the first things we noticed when we got here was that uh, they were a little... That's a good phrasing. I don't want to make it sound like it's bad for other kids, but they, there was, they were very um, intellectually driven. They're critical thinkers. That's good. Very critical thinkers. We've had, we've had other, we've worked with other youth that was, that was loved being with each other, but didn't always like process the word the same way. We've noticed that your group of youth, your teens, um, are really good at analyzing. We've asked some deep questions. The more frivolous uh, Sunday or Wednesday night lessons that we've had have never been met as well as the harder questions and the harder issues. Um, your youth want to be pushed and challenged, and they want to grow, and they have great ideas and are very, very deep and are pushed into a world constantly around them that's asking these kinds of questions. Um, that's something that's awesome. Um, keep developing that because there's a lot of things coming ahead of them. They'll go to college. Maybe they'll go to a Christian college. Maybe they won't. At any place, they're going to be asked a lot of questions about their faith. Don't make this place such a shelter that they can't deal with things later. Make this a place where you can push those boundaries a little bit, spread the edges a little bit, force harder thoughts in because there's no way you're going to be prepared if you got thrown into the deep end right after you leave. Um, we've been with your adult classes some. I got to teach on the prophets. I almost made a joke about how I get more casual each time I preach and eventually I'd pull an Ezekiel thing and like just come naked and <laughs> lay on the side of the... I wouldn't do that. That would be terrible. Uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, we've enjoyed being with you. 
in class time. We've had a lot of really great discussions. Um, I got pushed back on things, and that's always good. Um, and you know, we've had we've had a lot of really fun discussions, and it's hard to just say that because that's like, oh, okay, well, great. Um, give us some specifics. Well, whatever. Um, that's not why this is about. You you are a group that is constantly looking for things that are going to stretch you, looking for ideas that are going to push you, looking for concepts that are going to challenge you, and that's important because you don't want to become stagnant. You don't want to become people who are just rehashing the same things over and over again. And that's not to say that going through the same passages in the Bible over and over again is not good, because that is excellent. That's what you want to do. But you want to look at those through new lenses and challenge them with things that you're seeing in culture. One of the things that we were taught in school, and I keep pointing over this way and stuff, Adam and I uh, went to ACU graduate school together. So he's, he's a preacher in Michigan. Um, you want to preach, we were taught, with the Bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other. Because if you're not helping your congregation deal with what's going on outside the doors, then you're falling back in time or you're trying to ignore what's going on and you're not recognizing the reality that everyone goes to when they leave these doors. Because no one lives here in this building. This is not where everything happens. Everything happens outside. And so there's a push and pull that we have to do on the outside. And I've seen a lot of that happen here in the way that you do classes, in the way that you talk, in the way that we challenge things. And that's good. Keep doing that because that's important. Um, this congregation, I was, uh, we were with Dwayne Lee, who you remember came and helped me teach a couple times. And one of the comments that he made to me was that this is probably the most diverse Church of Christ he's ever seen. Um, Diversity is a hard thing. There's still a saying that 10 o'clock on Sunday mornings is the most segregated hour in America. Um, it, it, we're blown away at how this has happened here. We don't know why. Um, I suspect Warren and Lisa have a lot to do with it. <laughs> um, but not just them. You know, a lot of you being able to put up with some of our really slow white music. Um, it's impressive sometimes because, man, hallelujah can sound real dirgy sometimes. Um, but keep that as an important thing because the kingdom of God is not going to be a place where everyone's the same. That's not where we're headed. God calls us to oneness, but not to become the same person. The body has many parts, and the body is made up of many parts. And having many parts makes it a stronger congregation. The more everybody looks like each other, the weaker a church is going to be. The more diversity that you can hold, and not just with race, but with age and with ideas and all kinds of other things, the more that you can hold those things in tension together and be okay with sometimes people having different ideas, the stronger you're going to be, and y'all are doing a great job with that. This is an impressive place from that front, and I'm blessed to have been here and get to witness some of that um, because I have not in my past witnessed much of that in congregations. Uh, missions. Missions. So who else is thinking about going to Honduras? Who's on the fence? Do I need to just walk around every person and poke you until you go? Two spots. If, if, if you haven't been on a mission trip ever, you need to go. You need to go. Um, if you have been on a mission trip, you need to go. Because you know how awesome it is to go. And to, you're, not, you're not going to take the word of God to Honduras. The word of God is there. God is already in Honduras. You are going, and you will be changed more than you're going to change anybody else. And it's awesome. You're going to give some relief to some people who need it, because that's what always happens on mission trips, is there's people that are there that live there, that that's their life, and you get to be something that refreshes them so they can do the work long term. Um, that is such an important ministry. That's what short-term missions are. Short-term missions are helping long-term missions. Um, you will be changed. If you can go, do it. If you can't go, try to make it happen anyway. It's totally worth it, I promise. Um, on missions, y'all do a lot with missions, and it's great. I love missions so much. Uh, my grandparents were missionaries. They were in South Africa and then Vancouver. Um, and missions is baked into our blood. 
um, being able to go and talk about Jesus in other places, to realize that Jesus isn't just here, that Jesus is everywhere, that God really is across the entire world, that there are people every day, or not every day, every Sunday, that are sharing communion together, and that we're all sharing communion together all the way around the globe, is such a powerful and important thing to think about, that there is something that unites us stronger than anything that can divide us, something that beats every border, every language, everything else, that we take this body and this bread and we worship the Lord and Savior of the universe. And we all do that. That's so powerful. And if you can go and you can experience that, do it. And that's why for people like Jason, it's so important. And this happens every year, year after year after year, because you go and you see these things and you experience things that are awesome, amazing. It changes your life. And a lot of you, I know, have been changed by these experiences. And you bring those back and you're excited. And that's important because the church sometimes can forget its mission. Don't forget the mission. You haven't been. That's something great about y'all. Those are kind of the biggest things that I've seen. There's a lot of other things going on. Lots of things I'm sure I haven't seen. And there's always people doing stuff behind the scenes people going and helping out everyone else around, going and helping people. There's going to be people going and doing service for Allison Roberts' mom. Uh, grandma? Mom? Grandma. Um, that's good. That's important. Those are the things that you want as a congregation. Those things are powerful. So be thankful for the congregation that you're in because this is a great congregation. This is a great congregation. God is here and doing much among you. What more can you want? Now, the second little section of this first part, um, there's a lot of stuff coming up for y'all that I want you to just kind of have in your minds. Um, you've got camp has already started. Camp Manitani stuff is already going on. That's a big deal for this congregation. Keep that in prayer. Like be excited with the kids that come back from that because they're going to have all had a great time and help them to stay excited about the things that you're doing with Christian brothers and sisters. You know, sometimes we were, we were having a joke argument the other day about kids running in church. And we we're saying, like, oh, you don't want kids to run in church because that's not safe, which is true. Like, running in church is not the greatest idea because you can definitely get hurt or hurt someone. Um, and I was like, yeah, because I like to play the devil's advocate all the time. But yeah, but like, they're having fun, and that's what we want, right? Is for people to think of church as a fun place. So like, you know, don't run in church. But we do want to do things that, that do, for, especially for our children, make this a fun place and not just the most boring place that you have to come to every weekend. Um, this needs to be something that we're excited about because... There's exciting things happening, and sometimes we have trouble translating those things from the way that we work as adults to the way kids work. And that can be hard sometimes. Um, so as camp is happening and as all these exciting things are happening, you know, don't feel bad about singing songs from camp up here sometimes or, or doing some fun things. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, you've got VBS coming up. Hopefully we're going to see some kids from the neighborhood. That would be awesome. We always want to reach out to those around us. Um, be praying about that. Be excited about that opportunity. Be excited about the opportunity to, to meet people. Uh, keep your mind and heart open that people don't need to change to come into these doors. That God does changing. Um, and it's okay no matter what people look like, smell like, what they believe, how they act. This needs to be a place where we welcome them. Where everyone is welcome. Because Jesus welcomed everyone. Remember when Jesus was turning people away? They were like the super religious people. <laughs> what anybody else? Um, election season is coming up. Yeah, voting. Got a lot of red, white, and blue in here. 
uh, Tony Campolo teaches at Eastern University. Um, he has this quote that I like. And uh, he says, uh, I love America. It's my favorite Babylon in the world. <laughs> but it's still Babylon. There's nothing wrong with being proud of the things that this country has done. But this country will fall, like all countries have fallen before. God will not. The kingdom of heaven is what we need to be proclaiming. And so as we go into this election season, keep your eye on the prize. Jesus. The transformation of the world into the kingdom of heaven. Um, that means be nice. <laughs> Try not to, you know, cut other people with political things because that's not going to help anybody because everyone's already made up their mind anyway. So arguing doesn't do that much anyway. Be salt and light in these discussions. Be people who try to look at every side of things and to engage in positive talk. Um, be representatives of Jesus. Because that's who we are. We are all little carriers of the Holy Spirit. Was it Jason, too, who said, we're, we're all possessed by the Spirit. You know, be, be possessed. Um, <laughs> you can use that later as a series title. It's a great title. Um, last thing. Um, you know, just as you are going through this time, you are going to be going through times of disorientation, reorientation. Uh, you're going to be going for a while here of trying to figure out what is going on um, because you're in a place again without a preacher. Um, that's, like I said before, that's not bad. That's not bad. Um, you have very talented people in this congregation who can deliver some very solid sermons, and there are people in this congregation you don't know yet can deliver some very solid sermons. Don't be afraid to give people a chance. Don't be afraid to reach where you didn't think that maybe someone wanted to. Um, offering the call, having some fresh blood, not bad. Because um, you never know what you'll find, and you'll never know how you'll be changed, because God will work through this time. Um, I don't believe that God necessarily moves everything around that's happening. But I believe God is sovereign and that God's going to work through everything that's happening. Um, I had to delete a Newsboys song because it, this bridge line frustrated me. He says, you make all things work together for my good. And when I heard that, I said, that doesn't sound quite right. That makes it sound like you're making everything work out good for me from the get-go. But what the scripture says is, we know in all things God will work for the good of those who love him. There's going to be things that happen that are not great, and we're going to, God's going to work through those things. So there can be bad things. That's okay. God's will will be done. So I have some, uh, some ideas to help keep things fresh. Um, I want to give you permission for some stuff. I'm going to use my master divinity powers to give you permission. <laughs> Brittany's just like rolling her eyes like, you're the worst. Like, I can't believe you're saying this stuff. We talk a lot. This is something we don't do a lot. Um, but we talk a lot. If you look at the Psalms, all of human emotion goes through the Psalms. There are psalms of excitement and praise where everything is happy and everything is great and God is amazing and awesome. And there are times, why did you do this, God? Why do things have to be this way? Why are things so awful? That's okay. If you need to take time to lament as a congregation together, do it. I would recommend that every congregation at least once a year has a service that's totally lament. Go through people who have died, things that have happened that have been rough on the congregation, and bring those to light because we are not a place where we need to hide things and make things just all smiles for everyone else. 
Real family doesn't do that. Real family talks about it and they cry together and they share together. And you want to be real family. Real family. Because you don't break up with your family. You get through it with your family. You might have some trouble for a while, but you get through it eventually. Um, and on that same token, well, not same token, but e experiment. It is okay to try new things. It's okay to try something new, and if it doesn't work, don't do it. And it's okay to try something new, and if it works, try it more. And here's some examples of that. Um, for the sermon time, you don't always have to have somebody just up and talking. And you've done this before. You've done like mission reports and things like that. Those are great. Try things like testimonies sometimes. Try things like have a panel up here that goes over an issue um, that, where you have people talk. Sometimes it can be really scary for people to come up here by themselves, but you, can, but you need to hear voices of other people. And you can't get them up here without maybe interviewing them. You know, have a person who's asking questions to another person so they don't feel like they have to prepare the same way. These are good things to do sometimes because there are people who have amazing insight in our congregation, whose lives have stories that we need to hear, that we need to grow from, and we are never going to hear them because of the way we do things in the setting. So sometimes change the setting. Change the way you do some things because sometimes you can hear new, new stories, new messages. Um, Take the whole time for the Lord's Supper. Don't do a sermon. Do a long Lord's Supper. Take time to talk to people who you have trouble with. Air out your grievances before you take the Lord's Supper. Uh, put the trays up here and have people come up and have conversations about it. There's nothing, you know, the Lord's Supper, mind you, in the first century, it did not have trays that were passed around. It was around a table because everyone was eating together. Have a fellowship meal and do the Lord's Supper during the fellowship meal. Then everyone will feel like they have to stay. Uh, <laughs> all kinds of tricks you can do. Um, Paul is starting working on outreach in the neighborhoods. Do that. Do that. That is such a great thing. Uh, Brittany and I and Adam, uh, for a while, were working with a congregation in Abilene called Grace Fellowship. And we would go every Sunday and we would walk down a street. And we had houses that we went to every Sunday. And the people that we went to see pretty much never came to church with us. But we went and we were church in their homes. And we didn't go in asking them, can we pray for you? We said, at first at that time, we said we have this building and what do we need to do with it? What would you like in your community? What would you like this to be? How can this be something for you? Um, there are people that are looking for connection that don't want to come here. And the church was never meant to be tethered to a building. Just like we talked about this morning, God was not tethered to a temple. Kind of talked about that. That wasn't like the main point of the lesson. So, you know, I didn't miss it. Like, that, that was in, in there somewhere. <laughs> God, I think David, you said God is on the move. Like Aslan in the Narnia. God's on the move. God's doing stuff outside of these walls. Find him. Um, find him in the neighborhoods, because there's people around here that are, that are hurting. And you know that. There's people in here that are hurting, too. Find them. And that's, that's the last of this part. Um, be, be community with each other. Be family with each other. Be people who want to do things together. It doesn't have to be in the building all the time. Um, churches in the first century met in houses. Life groups, you'll go back to doing that. That's great. I love life groups almost more than any other part of church um, because that's the time when you are just together like family in-house. Um, be each other's community. Be the people who know what's going on with each other. Um, fight to know people because there will be people who who don't always want to be known, fight to know them, because it's worth it. Um, we're going to pray real quick, and then we're going to transition to the next part, and um, then we'll actually do the grace and peace part. Let's pray. Father, I am so thankful for this congregation, for King of Prussia. I'm thankful for the people here who we love so much, and who you love so much. 
Um, I pray that in this time that's coming ahead, that there would be great things that would continue to happen here. That steam would not be lost. That um, this group would keep their eye on the kingdom and would pray every day that your will be done. God, we love you. We praise you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Miss Brittany's going to come up, and we're going to do a science experiment. So what we need is for kids to come up. You're going to sit here on this part down here. Yep. Come on up. If you are a child or think you're a child, go ahead and come up. Thank you, Miss Sarah. No, Miss Sarah's top control. And go ahead and have a seat down here. for all of you, so, you know, it's got to be safe. There will be slightly dangerous hazardous materials on the stage. Okay. So, Mr. Jonathan and I were talking the other day, and we decided that we wanted to try out an experiment with you guys this morning. And this Can y'all hear? experiment is called How Do We Get to Heaven? Interesting. Okay. Let's see. This is everything. Okay, so who of my readers can tell me what this says? Sin. Sin. Oh, and what is sin? Does anybody have a good definition? What is it? Not bad stuff. Bad stuff? Zachary, you got a definition too? It's something bad that you do against God. Yes, that is an excellent definition. So Zachary said that a sin is something bad that you do against God. Okay, and then I have something else here. Can you tell me what this says? Sean. Good deed. It says good deed. And what is a good deed? Yeah. Addie. It's another help someone. I love that definition. You guys didn't hear Addie said that a good deed is something that you do to help someone. Let me tell you, here's a label for it, but in this bag, I have a whole lot of good deeds. Okay, so when Mr. Jonathan and I read the recipe for this experiment, it said you have a bowl, and I've got this line right here, okay? And all you have to do to get to heaven is fill the bowl up to this line, okay? And use the ingredients, and then you should be able to get all the way up. So, first of all, the Bible says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So that means all of us do bad things against God sometimes, so we have to put sin into the bowl. Okay. And if you were closer, which I don't want you to get to be, it would smell really strong because sin is stinky. Okay. Here we go. Lots of sin. Okay. So we got a lot going on in the bowl. We got to fill it up. Okay. So I've got my good deeds here. Hmm. Levi, how many good deeds do you think I need to fill up the bowl with to get to heaven? To get to this line. 19? Ooh, that is a good guess. Okay, so I think this is about 19 maybe, the handful. Let's put it in. Oh no. What's happening? It's sinking. Oh. It's dissolving. It's going away. Well, you know what? Levi, 19 was a really good guess, but I think you're going to need to do a lot more good deeds to go to heaven. You're going to need to leave singing like every single Sunday of the year and pray. Okay. How many do you think we need? Hayden? Um, 500. 500? That's a lot. Okay. Let's start putting them in. Oh, man. Well, look, it looks like it's going to go to the top. Oh. Oh, but it's still sinking. It's going away. Now, how many do you think? So, me, Sean? Yeah, you, Sean. The whole bag. The whole bag? Oh. Miss <laughs> Fran, I'll promise I'll clean this up later. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, it's working. Oh, oh it's it's No, it's not. Look. Once all the hard things happen in life, all the pressure, all the things going on, still goes right back down. All those good deeds. But wait a minute. 
I have a great idea. What if you are a super awesome person at church and you do a lot of great things, just like maybe like Hayden's grandma, you're a wonderful person, you do all kinds of things, you got a really big good deed. You think that'll fill it up? Maybe, okay. There it goes, let's put it in. Oh no. That's sinking too, you're right, Levi. Oh, Mr. Jonathan, I don't know what I did wrong. I don't know. Even that big good deed that hmm. grandma did just didn't work. I don't know. Yeah, you are splashing. What do you think? What do you guys think? What's gonna what's gonna work? It looks like no matter how many we put in, it just goes away. The whole rest of the bag. You think the whole rest of the bag? We'll put in a few more. I I think all those would go away too, bud. See? Maybe we need something else. Cool. Hmm. What else do you think could help? Is there anything left? left in the box? Oh, they've got some guesses. What's your guess, John? Take away the sin. Take away the sin? Yeah. Well, that's a pretty good guess. Yeah. In fact, maybe we need something like grace. Yeah. Does anybody know what grace is? Grace is something that God gives us for free. Something we don't have to do anything to get. And I bet that if we start pouring grace in, It'll fill it up all but, the way. But wait, Mr. Jonathan, we can't pull them because with the good deeds, whenever I smashed it with my wooden spoon, uh -huh. it all went back down. Oh, okay. So well. let's try it. Oh, it's not dissolving. It isn't dissolving. Look at that. It's filling up more. Hmm, let's put a little more grace in and see what happens. Think we can fill it up all the way this time? Yeah. I need a lot of grace, so we're putting in a lot. <laughs> lots and lots of grace. Oh. It's gonna overflow. Yeah. So, so can you do enough good deeds in your life to get to, to, get heaven? to heaven? Yes. You think yes still? <laughs> no, no. You need grace from God to get to heaven. That's the only way you can get there. There's nothing you can do to go to heaven. You can't do anything. Only God's grace. What'd you say? Unless climb a mountain. You can climb a mountain. You think climbing a mountain is going to get you to heaven? I mean, you can try it, but I don't think it's going to work. Yeah, that's okay. You can climb a mountain and have God's grace. <laughs> yeah, that's true. It's okay to climb a mountain. All right, guys. Thanks for coming up here. Go ahead and sit down. All right. So there you go. Grace. The only thing that's going to fill up the cup. When I uh, sign my emails, I sign my emails grace and peace. Um, and I want to tell you why for a minute. Um, I used to sign them love and peace, and that sounded kind of weird and a little hippie. And uh, I was listening to a podcast, and the guy who does the podcast always says grace and peace. And I was like, oh, that's the word I need. I need grace. Um, and he explained why, and I'm going to share a little bit of that with you because it's true for me too. Uh, grace, Greek is charis, but the idea in a lot of ways in the Bible comes from the Hebrew chesed. Chesed. Chesed appears a lot in the book of Ruth um, and in a lot of other places in the Old Testament. And it's the idea of loving kindness. Um, in a Hebrew class I was in, we talked about it, and I asked, can, can the word chesed in some ways mean like the fruit of the spirit? And he said, oh, maybe not all of them, but yeah, kind of. Like the idea of chesed is more than just grace or love. It's this bigger, more flexible kind of word that covers a lot of things. Um, and so when I say grace, and when we talk about the grace that God gives, um, it's more than just the simple definition of getting what you don't deserve. Because uh, if you know the difference between grace and mercy, mercy is not getting what you do deserve. Um, if, I've, if I've committed a crime and I don't go to prison, I've been given mercy. If I'm sitting quietly and have done nothing and someone gives me a handful of $100 bills, that's grace. <laughs> grace is getting something as opposed to something not being given. Um, Jesus, Jesus offered grace. 
I'm going to read a passage from Romans chapter 5. You can turn there if you want. There's going to be 6 through 8 and then verse 15. You see, at just the right time when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Verse 15, the gift is not like the trespass. For if the many died by the trespass of the one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? None of us were worth dying for. None of us had done enough to merit anything God offered. I like to talk about covenants. Because in covenants, you made a deal between two parties and you took animals and you cut them open in half. And you laid out their bodies beside each other. And to make the covenant, you both walked between the bodies so that you knew that if you broke it, you were going to get cut in half like those animals were. But when God makes a covenant with Abraham, they do all those parts and God goes through. And then when Abraham's about to go through, God goes through again. Because God knows you can't do anything. That's what grace is. Grace. And grace is our mission. It's what, part of what we're here for. It's to let people know that we are terrible people. <laughs> and that there is nothing about us that makes us special to earn grace. Because God is so good. And God gives that grace for free. None of us have a pile of good deeds stacked up high enough to go to heaven. It's only God's grace that gets us there. <coughs> Second word I use is peace. Peace comes from Irene in Greek, shalom in Hebrew. Shalom doesn't just mean peace. Shalom is the sense of wholeness, the sense of everything being the way it should be. Peace, uh, when I talked about pacifism way back, you know, we had some talks about pacifism and how I'm a pacifist. Being a pacifist for me doesn't just mean that I don't want to fight. Being a pacifist means I don't want to fight because I want to do something that's going to be so good for someone else that they're going to hopefully either lay down their arms or they're going to kill me. Those are my options. Peace, shalom, this kind of idea is not just about being apathetic. Apathy is not peace. Just not doing anything, just being quiet is not peace. Peace is caring so much about others that you will go out of your way to make their life better. I'm going to read another passage from Romans, chapter 14 this time. Um, this is in the whole like meat sacrifice to idols and eating it section. Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in the way of a brother or sister. I'm convinced, being fully persuaded in the Lord Jesus, that nothing is unclean in itself. But if anyone regards something as unclean, then for that person it is unclean. If your brother or sister is distressed because of what you eat, you are no longer acting in love. Do not by your eating destroy someone for whom Christ died. Therefore do not let what you know is good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Because anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and receives human approval. Let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification. Peace in this context you got people who were eating meat, sacrificed to idols, and they said, it's just meat, because idols aren't real. And there's other people who said, that bothers me. So you don't just not do something. It's you do something so that someone else is better off. That is what peace is. So when I say grace and peace, when you send me an email, and I email you back, and it says grace and peace, my hope is that as part of our mission as a church, and as people of God, is that we extend the ideas that we don't do anything that gets us to heaven, that God does it. 
and that we are willing to do whatever it takes to make sure other people are blessed. Because we are not here to become better or richer or more well-off than other people. We are here to be like Jesus and deny ourselves and take up our cross and follow him. And that means sometimes pain, sometimes suffering. And we don't do much of that. But to really show people who Jesus was, it takes death and resurrection. But death comes first. And that's okay. So in this time of disorientation and reorientation, may you be people of grace and peace. One last thing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn His face toward you and give you peace.